know is happening because there's a lot of things happening that are really exciting. But then Scott also has a question for the group. So maybe we'll start with Scott's question after we go around and just say hi and who you're calling from and who we are. Um, this is my daughter, Genevieve, to finish our introductions. <laughs> She's going to be with me. She's a year old and getting her first front two teeth in. So, yeah. yeah. All right, I'll pass it over to Carolyn, which is great to see you, Carolyn. Been seeing you in a while. Hey, yeah, I've been um, I've been traveling quite a bit this summer. Um, I just got well last week, but I, I got back from North Carolina where I went for uh, the Southeast Environmental Education Alliance Leadership Clinic, and um, they had this whole landscape analysis of environmental education in the Southeast, and they did some climate stuff. So um, I think I I think I shot you an email, Gina. I would love to have them. Um, have them talk about that and I am going to need to I don't know if you heard that in the background I don't think there's anyone who needs an introduction but Tallahassee she her Cleo Institute uh, headquartered in Florida um, I need to go off camera for just a second because uh, my kitten my new foster kittens just finished lunch and are asking to be let out of their uh, crate and it will be very it'll be very interrupt uh, disruptive if I don't go let them out <laughs> Uh, we just pass it on, Don. Sure. Hi, uh, this is Don Hoff. I am oh, really? director of teacher programming at uh, the Center for Climate Change Education at PRI, which is our, our new thing that's not really officially out yet, but is uh, coming, will be unofficial, officially unveiled at the uh, uh, GSA at the end of the month. And I am driving from home to Ithaca at the moment. What's your commute like, Don? How long is it? Uh, it's about two hours and 15 minutes. From your house? I only go about once. Oh. Yeah, I only go about once a month. I'm a, I'm a telecommuter and have been oh. telecommuting for uh, since 2008, 16 years now. Oh, my gosh. Since before it was cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you want me to pass it for you, or can you see? Yeah, I, I can see. Colleen's here, so pass to Colleen. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, good morning from Alaska. Um, <laughs> Colleen Fisk, she, her pronouns on uh, Denina lands outside Wasilla, Alaska, and I'm the education director for the nonprofit Renewable Energy Alaska Project. Uh, so yeah, good to see everybody. And I think Wendy, Wendy been introduced yet? Hi, I'm Wendy Johnson, um, Science Education Specialist with the National Center for Science Education. Colleen, I have actually been to Wasilla. My parents lived in Palmer for a while, so um, I was there in, I think it was 2019. There was like a huge heat wave. It was like uh, record setting highs. Yeah, we had a lot of wildfires that year. There was so yeah. much wildfire smoke. <laughs> Yes, yeah. that was definitely going on as well. It's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, I I graduated from Palmer High, so I love it. Okay, up nice. All right, um, and I will pass it to um, Scott. Thank you, Scott Lewis, uh, Florida Climate Educators Network here in uh, Florida, and. Uh, I'm going to just let you know in a, about an event we're having in two weeks. We're having a presentation by a faculty member from University of South Florida who studies language arts and literature. And she's going to give a presentation on how to link how language arts and English teachers can connect to climate change in their classrooms. So I think that'll that's a different audience than some of the folks that we usually see you on. So I'm hoping I'll, I'll drop a, a PDF in the chat room in case anybody has some language arts and teachers that they'd like to get the word out to about making those kinds of connections. And then as Gina said, I'll raise a question a little bit later in the conversation. So uh, thank you, James. I think maybe are you you have it gone yet. Yeah, thanks Scott. And so I know who to pass to. Cassandra, have you gone before after me? 
I, I just want to I want to have someone to pass to otherwise or Gina or uh, otherwise the, 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 it just goes back to Lindsay I guess right I came in a minute late so I didn't know about things um, so Jim Callahan I teach in some specific schools where we we teach all year round climate change um, I uh, our mobile climate science labs does support for many other teachers especially in the bay area san francisco area and in the DC, washington dc metro area um, we work out of museums and teach there where schools will come up to us and as in the picture behind me we're also take advantage of going out into the public at this event which is at over a hundred thousand people and that's a way just to find all kinds of people they come up and they talk so one of the things i'm hoping if if we can't do it today, I understand. But Lindsay, it would be a, a topic just for somewhere in here, comparing notes on conversations we've had with teachers in schools um, more recently. And and uh, part of it is when people come up to us, they have nice things to say about each of your programs. And I want to be able to share that a little with you. Like, Wendy, we had one of your self-described supporters of NCSE come up and talk to us on Sunday. So anyway, um, that's that's what I got. Lindsay, there'll be things of working with your programs as well. Yeah, I don't think Cassandra has gone yet. I think you were right. Sorry about that. I'm um, eating some lunch, so I was off camera. I am Cass Miller. I am the Education Program Coordinator at Action for the Climate Emergency, and you should have her first pronouns. And um, I'm always excited to hear about the amazing programs that y'all are putting out. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but we have a teacher um, newsletter that is, you know, available and sent out to 40,000 teachers in the um, constant UI. So I'm always looking for resources that I can share with them um, through our newsletter, especially those that are, that can be applied to teachers throughout the country. So um, feel free to email me anytime anything's going up. Um, Thanks. Great. Yeah, and my last. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was like, do I pass it to someone? <laughs> no, you're last. You're last. I think. Yeah. No, Gina. G I mean, everybody knows Gina, but Gina, do you want to say anything? I can just say hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Good to see you. Um, I am doing a training today, so I'm gonna pop off a little bit early. But um, Katie should join halfway through. Um, but I'm doing a crucial. Uh, it's a training called Crucial Conversations um, for Mastering Dialogue through through our university, which is actually really cool. I'm excited to try to implement some things. But um, anyway, I'll be probably logging off in a minute or two here, but good to see you all. Cool. Yeah. Well, if you have any announcements from Clean or from your work, if you pop them in the chat, I'll we'll make sure they get on into our share out time at the end of the meeting today. Sounds good. Yeah, I'll share some um, info information about our upcoming webinar in the chat. So I'll pop that in there. Awesome. Uh, cool. Well, with that, I'll pop, pop it over to Scott with your question, Scott. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Gina was kind enough I to to you know, put this on the agenda for a few minutes here. Um, I've got a question that I thought this would be a good audience to ask. And the last a couple of weeks ago, I heard a presentation here in Broward County, where I live, um, which is, includes Fort Lauderdale. And they, the county did a presentation, they did a tree canopy survey. And they found that actually the tree canopy percentage has dropped three or four percent since the last time they did this survey, maybe four or five years before which I was surprised at. I guess I shouldn't be, so given the developments in South Florida, a lot of people are still moving here. Um, but it, it sort of surprised me, and I wondered, you know, well, what is the role of schools in, in helping restore some of that tree canopy? And it turns out the folks in Miami-Dade County are actually putting together their own urban tree planning plan right now and they intend to connect with the schools in some way. I'm not sure I'm not sure what that is at this point and they may not know. But I wondered and and Gina did a quick search in the clean database and there's a there actually turns out to be quite a few activities there. But I was curious about um 
whether any of the group is on the phone is on the call now has has had some good experiences with activities related to tree canopy or putting in trees in school areas and what those might be and you know particularly as they might relate to climate change and then also a kind of a subset of that is that the county has has the GIS uh, shape files and and so there's some mapping you know that might be good for high school and above to sort of do some kind of analyses on that but i don't know if anybody here might have a suggestion about those kinds of activities as well so a little bit of brainstorming here oh here's some okay carolyn's got something yeah there. Uh, thank you sure go ahead who's who's yeah, Don. Um, uh, my, we have uh, some resources on uh, on our website on uh, carbon sequestration in trees and measuring how much carbon a tree is holding. And we, uh, in our NOAA grant with uh, Prince George's County Schools, we have, uh, which is in Maryland and one of the largest, in the top 20 largest school districts in the country. Uh, 135,000 students in 28 high schools. And um, we have some student data about heat island effect and canopy. And I should, uh, if you want to email me, I'll, I'll forward your email along to Alex Moore, who's, um, who's looked at that. And, and also um, census track and uh, uh, poverty data uh, for uh, that uh, shows that the Island and tree canopy issues are worse the uh, lower SES schools. Great, great. Thank you, Don. Do you have? Could you drop your email in the chat? I think I heard most, pretty much everything. You're, you're going yeah. in and out a little bit, but I right. think that would. Well, I'm driving right can, now, so, <laughs> so I yeah, can't. yeah. Um, right. If, if you go oh, to okay. priweb.org. Uh, okay. I can. Uh, you can grab Don's yeah, email. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, uh, I'm I'm happy to put okay. Don's email. Yeah, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is a great question, um, Ms. Cass speaking. This is a great question. Um, I know locally in Hillsborough County, which is not too far from Broward, um, I've worked with organizations who have had to get grants from like Roots and Shoots and and et cetera to like make this possible because it's, it's really hard to get funding for trees and um, roots and shoots are just like, you know, uh, it's the Jane Goodall Foundation. They give like $250 grants to like um, schools that are, you know, teachers that request it or whatever. But um, it feels like this would be a great opportunity for us to like harness the knowledge that they've utilized um, from like Dawn, for example, and like how they got that done and mobilize around like a school board issue and, and try to get funding for this and see how we can like incorporate it into the curriculum because uh, the, the cost is really the battle here. Um, sure. Are you are you proposing to do something in along those lines or, or what did you have? I'm just suggesting that if we combine our our know how in our power and and um not necessarily even us ourselves but like potentially like having a committee and a, a an offshoot or or something where we can have the like when i think of like a community organization that would likely be able to take something like this on in capacity i think of like the ptsa the pta or whatever this is the kind of stuff that they do where they try to like um they have to have a program in a school, so it could be a pretty easy program for them to have where they would um, do some sort of environmental action. So um, I'm not sure that any of us have the, in our respected organizations, have the like capacity to do it, but we could create some sort of program that they could like copy and paste. Um, for Oh, I don't know. I didn't realize I turned myself off. Um, Roots and Shoots is doing a youth environmental summit in St. Petersburg. Um, actually, I think it's like this this Saturday. Uh, some of our regional organizers are going to be there doing a doing a presentation. So, um, I know that's not possible for everyone, but 
yeah, if you if you know folks sort of in that Tampa Bay area, um, that could be a really good way to get involved. Okay, so Scott, I can um, speak to uh, the issue of urban forests and, and tree protection and so on is another thing that I've worked on a lot, especially in the Bay Area. Um, but then also learning how its values compare different parts of the country. Um, it, it's, it's clearly one of the important subjects that, that we should look at in terms of action and look at something where the students can get involved. Um, I can point to, um, I'd also put tree planting, putting new trees in the ground would be in the cat it would be among the category of the very widely promoted this is what an action is right i mean it might be third or fourth if recycling is number one that's what you're supposed to do which everybody should do but we're all supposed to do it by law or in many parts of the country it's supposed to be a law so it's it's a thing that the, that the uh, districts like to do and then there is um i know this, but tree planting is like number three or four right that people do so great um I think it's it's uh, there's a couple of things of uh, there's in many many areas of the United States tree plant we have to be a I don't know I, I would recommend that we're aware of when there's an action of something to do that we can be manipulated as pawns we can be used to cover more serious things because if you here's the thing with plea tree planting in a lot of cities they'll prom, the city will promote the fact that they've just planted a hundred trees of the year and they will hide the fact that they cut down 10,000 trees that same year right so in terms of when just in terms of the numbers right there the numbers are overwhelmingly greenwashing absolutely in that one but then if you think of the carbon sequestration that goes on then it becomes about a hundred thousand to one right or at least ten thousand to one I mean the tree behind me is an example that is a substantial tree right and and that the the tree planting is often used as a cover for that's what we feel good we'll put our emphasis on that and hide that and i think we want to be aware of that with our students that i work with and things is that well how do you deal with that how how do you not be you don't want to say well, you don't want to plant trees but how do we not be more, more uh, demoralized and also be aware of it um in terms of protecting the trees, I think that's extremely important, but there's also kind of what can students do where they actually can be effective and be heard. And one of the things that I think, uh, you know, I haven't had the bandwidth to really go full bore on this like I'd like to, but one of the ways that students actually can do something is exactly that looking at the mapping that's being done by satellites, but take that information and do really interesting analysis because there's all this information and then some are analyzing it, but it is, it is rich with analysis. I wanna give this example of this one school that's behind me. It's Oakland Tech Technical School, uh, High School in Oakland. It's a public school. One is they have been cutting down all the big trees. This, the district wanted to cut down this tree and was ready to do it and the city was gonna back them up. And basically it's because trees are hard, uh, take more money to maintain than lawn. So they wanted just to remove the tree for lawn, even though all the effects, all the positive effects of the tree were not being taken in consideration. But anal analyzing this high school from the satellites, and you can see how it's being decimated. You can go back through Google and see how the trees used to be there, they're out there. This is next to a private school that has like 50% of the canopy of the, of the land is, is trees compared to 10% of this. And it's the same land, the same place. You can see this difference of disequity. And that's something that the students can really understand and help promote. Knowing that, and I'll try and wrap up here, knowing that much of the analysis that where people have, organizations have said, well, we've done the analysis, come here and things. Frankly, this stuff is really weak, if not wrong. Okay, so I don't, I don't wanna focus on, on uh, criticizing others, but that this is a room for the students to do a good job. So not talking too publicly, but for instance, if you look at tree analysis and things, the big place you go to find is American Forest Tree Equity Score, okay? I've looked at the tree equity score and their analysis of the different things, and it's pretty much garbage. Uh, it, when we look at the Bay Area, the way they analyze things, they're giving almost all the cities, like they, you've got an 80, 80 score, right? Where 100 is the best. And the cities that are better 
are getting lower scores and the, it's it's all you're getting all these goofy goofy things we compare oakland and the bay area to washington dc which is an area where relatively the public puts a lot of attention to trees the 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 amount of trees is way strong in DC, especially in the wealthy white areas, but even in the poor and, and areas of people of color, the amount of trees isn't there. And that's an interesting comparison where the students can do that. They can do that with photo photographs. They can do that. They can compare it and stuff. So it's an action item where they're learning really valuable school skills that I think is important. And lastly, I would say we want to be aware of the tree planting thing. Again, I don't want to criticize it. Please do it. But one, be aware of your choose, but also be, as far as the skill set that students learn by being part of tree planting, it tends to be, that's pretty manual labor and not very skilled labor. I'm, again, please not to not do it, but can we have things that are building toward climate action careers? And I think that's not a particularly great one to, what are you going to be a tree planter in your life? You're not going to make any money, right? So anyway, those are just thoughts of it. I want it to be a strong one. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, James. Those are those are good points all around. Um, Cassandra, you had your hand up. You want to have yeah? There's something um, that you have some comment. Go ahead. Yeah, we're more talking in terms of like actionable items. Like we don't have to reinvent the wheel, in my opinion. Like I shared our climate future. We have letter to the editor. You can figure out like in terms of like scaling this to students and like making them aware of the problem and also encouraging them to be active as you shared you have like a language arts teacher who's going to be presenting um thinking about this as like a language arts activity where they can write a letter to their uh, you know for us it's like the hillsborough county board of county commissioners who make these rules and regulations on like trees and arbor and everything like that you could scale something and and align it with you know standards that are that teachers in florida since this is the demographic you're referring to are able to present this to their students make it an assignment and say like this is a problem you've done the research here's the research and then here's like the solution and write a letter to you know your board of county commit like our local it, it could be a very comprehensive um assignment or you know just resource yeah it certainly it certainly could be rich i, I think and and, and what you could do yes i'm i'm asking and james gave some good good you know some thoughts about that as well as sort of the higher end of kind of analyses that you could do and maybe there's some lesson plans already out there for example on gis analysis for you know and and you know even with, with heat island kind of effects maybe somebody's written up you know how you how you've got some comparison of canopy areas with gis or, you know, and, and got some data on the heat islands and you could do those kinds of analyses. I think, James, you're, you know, your point is well taken. If it's, you know, let's go out and put some trees in the yard, you know, the, and, and get some muscles or something from doing that. You're right. I mean, it's not really tie into some some more important kinds of activities that you're that you're doing. But you but I'm, I'm kind of wondering, you know, and, and you may have something in mind. James, uh, you know, is, is there sort of a set of activities that, you know, you think are higher end kind of things that I, that might be okay? It, well, how about, I'm going to give you one that's just a fun one that, that Global Climate Science Labs is really good at, and we're willing to share it. This is not something we're holding, we don't want to hold it close to our chest. When you do the heat island effect, and that is another one that's very heavily promoted. If you look at what a city or what schools are doing, heat island analysis and taking temperatures, that's really big. Right? There's a whole part of how tree canopy and vegetation fits into the heat island that is not really being covered hardly anywhere. And it's really cool. And it's so I love these ones where if you give this to the students, they are then moving ahead the whole program they're not just following behind what the adults are already saying and they're doing they're being the you know the the go the gophers they're just doing the work if you look at the real the albedo effect the reflectivity of vegetation okay that tree looks really dark you think well that's absorbing a lot of light why is that any better than the asphalt right why is that what well, it dirts better than that right that, that's dark well that's invisible in visible light okay because it's it's absorbing um in red and it's reflecting in green right 
in the other half of sunlight, shortwave infrared, where that light comes, all the light comes in and it, when it gets absorbed, it, 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 it heats up the object. In shortwave infrared, that tree is far more reflective than anything around there. It's reflect, more reflective than the building. It's reflective than white. It's like white paint. It is like super. So in, in other words, with these really inexpensive shortwave infrared cameras, the students can analyze a certain area and you see the other half of the albedo effect that the scientists are missing, the cities are missing, and they can do something that's like, whoa, trees are really important. Look how reflective they are because they evolved to absorb the light that they use for energy, right? And reflect the light that they have. In other words, they're just being cooked. They reflect green, but they do much more than that. Anyway, I'm just giving, I can show you how you do these cameras and things. And that's something that just, it's also just that amazing. When you see the trees, they look like they're made of snow. It's really cool. So anyway, that's just a short one of, if you want to do something to make people go, wow, that's one of them. Okay. I'm not going to say it's the only one, but that's one. Okay. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. That's that's a cool thing. You can, I guess, if you got the satellite, you can parse out the wavelengths on that and, well, and do those kinds of things. Right? Well, actually, so the thing again of if the so the students can learn the high end, right? We we want them to we want them to do everything, right? The letters and the hard work and the whole thing. But to learn to let them learn what NASA and NOAA and the, the all, all the other agencies do, right? When they analyze where trees are and where trees aren't. They use that property that it's extremely reflective in shortwave infrared, pretty reflective in green and not reflective in that with the cameras is called, uh, sorry, um, <laughs> I'm gonna get it backwards, NDVI, uh, no, NDVI, yes. It's analysis of these different spectrum. Right. That's how they do it. So the students would be learning how do they tell the satellites what the tree canopy is of a city you have to understand this infrared effect. Okay, so I mean, they're learning high end stuff that they can use in their careers, like using satellites that those are good long paying jobs, and you're really doing something about climate change, you're not just being given a shovel. Great, great. Thank you. Scott, I just put one in the a link in the chat to a subject to climate lesson. I was trying to find the other one that I'm actually more familiar with um, from a project I worked on called Carbon Time, and I can't find it. But this seems similar, where students like measure the diameter of a tree at breast height, and then they can calculate how much carbon it sequesters. Um, I I do think that often they need a very specific protocol like that to sort of get them started, right? Even though it's kind of cookie cutter, like here's what we do. Um, and then I think from there, then students could start to say, what other effects, right? We can calculate how much carbon a tree sequesters. Are there other, you know, benefits and, and maybe go into the um, absorption spectrum, right? There's lots of things about uh, photosynthesis and obviously connections kind of depending on the class. Right. Yeah, I have um, a similar lesson that we wrote up for Alaska because often those resources I've found don't have Alaska tree species. And so we, I had, like had to work with a researcher to find um, the calculations for the Alaska tree species. But then the focus is very much starting with thinking about the cultural significance of trees. I can think about like totem poles and making them for canoes and you know, just all the other values, um, you know, before even, and then heating, a lot of people heat, still heat with wood up here. And so um, a lot of different ways and then linking to Alaska examples, like um, in Toke, there's a lot of dead beetle kill trees. And so they have to clear them anyway for fire safety, but then using those dead trees for heating the school, for example, instead of otherwise it'd be like oil that would be heating the school. So, um, yeah, it's interesting because here it's not, you know, other than like maybe Anchorage, we're not heat, urban heat islands are not really a concern for us up here. <laughs> and so um, really thinking more about the the linking to fire and wildfire and the increase of um, like pests, like the beetle kill trees um, caused by climate change, like all the connections that we think about up here in Alaska. But I can right. add 
And no, thank you. Thank you. Now that's, and that's a valuable group like this is you have a, have unique perspectives from people that um yeah for sure i mean although the you know forest fires uh, you know and it's interesting i mean the of course the california folks and west coast people are, are worried a lot about those kinds of things um and that, that potentially that's an issue in florida at certain times and in the future um maybe not so much in the cities like some of the urban areas that you have in california but interesting, something for me to think about too. Such a rich conversation from what yeah. seems to be questions, Scott. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. And and I'll I'll add, you know, in tree planting, you need to think about um, maintenance of the tree, so you're not just putting a little a bunch of little twigs in the ground and then letting them die. Um, and you need to you know think about the appropriateness of the species you're uh, planting and um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me um, another thing from our NOAA grant which is uh, the name of the project it's a watershed of trees is um, how trees regulate the flow of water in an ecosystem um, and uh, so we have resources on that <laughs> great great thank you Oh, yeah, and I'll, I'll also note just one other thing is uh, that's important to remember or to know is that if you want to deal with um, um, mitigating climate change by planting trees, you should know that uh, um, an eight foot two by four has about the same amount of carbon in it as a gallon of gasoline. So uh, we, in 2023, we burned 374 million gallons of gas, so more than a gallon per person per day. And we are not growing two by fours at anywhere near that rate um, and don't really have the capacity to. So you need to recognize that this helps and it, you know, it helps with carbon sequestration. It helps with urban heat island effects. It, it helps with uh, reducing flooding and all of these sorts of things. Just doing this alone is not going to be enough. Scott, also, if I, uh, Don, I didn't mean to cut you off. You okay? No, I'm, I'm done. Great. And, th and thank you. That's so important on the thing of, you, you know, plant a few, few little saplings, which may not last, and then we let all the big ones get cut down. That's, you know, that's a lot of two by fours. Um, Scott, I've got in another screen, I just got up here, a split screen of uh, a typical tree in a park that's in Washington, D.C., but it could be anywhere. It could be in Alaska, it could be Florida. Right. On the right, of course, is visible light. It's the same tree, yeah. in shortwave infrared. You notice how, how bright it is, and you also notice how the dark sky is. I mean, there's a lot of science that those kids, that kids who do this can, um, here, here's the whole, here's the non-split screen version. That's a lot of reflectivity, and you don't yeah. notice that. And half of sunlight is in shortwave sure. infrared. Okay. Yeah, cool. That's, that's really, yeah, that's a, that's a really cool illustration of the issue right there, for sure. Well, thank you. I'll just add to, you know, one thing, Don, you made me, reminded me, um, one of the conversations I've had, you know, recently is just, it's a little worrisome about planting trees on the campus as far as, um, uh, you know, maintenance is a, the, some of the principals and those kinds of folks are worried because they really, they don't want to be responsible for the long-term maintenance of some of these trees. And that's an issue in trying to get some of these programs started on, on, the, on the campuses, I think. Although, you know, one of the things I also learned was, you know, there's only typically in the country, apparently there's only 6% canopy cover in, in schools across the country as a whole. Um, you know, as, as you paid, pointed out, James, there's some exceptions to some of the schools that are really into this stuff and know the value of the trees, but there's a lot of potential there for, for tree planting on campuses across the country. And I think one of the attractions to me is, especially in Florida, is you can you can bring in the conversation about climate change when you do that. And sometimes that's not so easy in this state. And maybe it's an opportunity for kids to get involved in in that in that work as well. And so 
Well, thank you, every, everyone. I appreciate the conversation and the, and the feedback. This is very helpful. Yeah, great. I'm like really um, impressed with all of us being able to dig deep on that one. That was a, an amazing conversation from this group. Uh, cool. Well, we have about a little over 20 minutes and I, you know, I was struck when, when I realized I was like, oh, I'm facilitating this work. I was kind of look, thinking about what are we going to talk about? And um, I realized that there's so much amazing things happening right now in climate education in particular. Um, and I have a few examples myself, but I, I know that there's like a historical norm for doing a like news from the community um, session for clean. And so I thought we could do that where we kind of talk about what news do we have, but I'd also love to just do like what news is coming out in your world as it relates to climate change education and what should people be reading? I've been seeing a lot of networks come out with lists, like what's your reading list for this week? Um, and I thought that'd be a kind of a really fun thing to try to do is not only share our news, but then maybe I'll like copy the chat and I'll send out a list of like, what should you be aware of? What should you be reading this week? Um, one example I have is that the um, continuing science learning magazine or publication from NSTA just dropped uh, an entire issue about climb time, Washington's climate change education initiative. It's got like seven articles on how to do statewide climate education organizing. Amazing resource that everyone should be reading. Um, and the, the other example I have is not out yet, but it should be coming out like next week is the North American Association for Environmental Education has been writing a guidelines for excellence um, called Teaching for Climate Justice and Education. And that's gonna be up, like out in the world next week. All the authors just got sent a copy. So I kind of thought it'd be fun for us to go around and say like, what do we have going on? But what are some other things maybe that you're reading or that you're feeling inspired by this week? And then I can send it out to the group maybe. Um, that's mine. I guess since I'm talking, I can share a couple more. I obviously don't have a hand to put in links, but um, Climate Generation is on our 20th annual Summer Institute, which will be coming up in J July. I know, like major milestone, 20th. Um, if y'all if y'all don't know, we do organize about 20 organizations from across the country to participate in hosting one aspect of the work and we kind of facilitate a community of practice or a learning group over six to eight months. Um, yeah, it's been that long, Katie, it's crazy. And so applications for that will be opening in October. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, and then also um, we, so the CERC Science Education Resource Center based in Carleton College in Minnesota and Washington University have they call it a nonprofit, um, but it's called the Midwest Climate Collaborative. And they, for since 2022, have been convening Midwest, I would say mostly higher ed folks to do climate change education, professional learning for themselves. And they actually hired us to come on and facilitate their long um, community of practice, like a working group to figure out how do we start taking action on some of these things. So that's starting in September. Um, and it's called the, sorry, Midwest. Let me type it out. Midwest Climate Collaborative Educator Community of Practice. Um, so we're kind of sending out announcements about that and kind of starting to convene people and get feedback on what that should look like. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, yeah, that's, that's my big news. I can pass it to someone else. If we want to put a stack, like if you raise your hand, then we can just call on you in order. That works. Cool. I'll pass it to Katie. Um, I put it, some things in the chat. You said reading lists. These are books, so not quite as fast to read as articles, but there was a great discussion last week in the Clean Call and some um, books that might be good to read right now, especially like more hopeful books. And that was something that was interesting to me. I can't read much right now, but I bookmarked them for like, I need to read those when I have a little more time and not <laughs> a small baby and a toddler at home. Um, and then 
the other thing I was going to mention in terms of stuff going on, Gina's been working on the next call for the Excel Summit. So we're going to try and do similar this year and host an opening in November and have the working groups go through May, close um, and have an, another closing event. And so we're trying to get new working groups going for this year or if you want to reestablish the ones from next last year, I think there was some interest with that as well. So some of the groups may continue on. We want to get some infusion of new topics as well. And we have some funds, um, just very small amount, but still kind of see funding to help some new groups um, this year. So she's working on the call for that and that'll probably come out um, soon. I think very soon we're trying to kind of get that done and hopefully have folks apply in September. So um, just watch out for that. Think about what you may want to do and um, if if you have other colleagues who might be interested in that, um, keep an eye out. We'll send that out soon. Uh, I got James next. Yeah, so um, I, when I compare on, on what people are reading and what teachers are using, um, having the opportunity to be in a lot of schools, but also have uh, many teachers come up to talk to me and uh, get in conversations to see which of these might be of interest to others that are here. So Wendy, as I mentioned on Sunday, we had somebody who I self identifies as a major supporter of NCSE, uh, wanting to check in about what the, the, you know, people are coming up and they're seeing what we're doing at this big event of 100,000 people. How do we relate to NCSE? And they're very pleased that we go way, way back with you and you know the way we, you know, we know what's going on when we promote and that kind of work. So I mean, there's, there's things on their conversation and what they had to say. Um, one of the things is working with those that are that part of what they're doing is promoting different curriculum or, or lesson plans or, or resources right I mean clean that's a big thing what cleans all about. Uh, comparing notes about what we're hearing and what we're doing so i'm always looking for teachers to first you ask what are they using and work with them don't tell them stop using that curriculum if it's good and use this or something like that but work with it, but then there is those that are using things of getting feedback to the the place that promotes it to say, what can we learn from this? What can we do about it? Um, one of the schools that teaches climate change more than anywhere in the country, we have the problem that the teachers who are really good at teaching climate change tend to burn out. They don't feel they're being supported. They don't have work. They're not being recognized because everything is the resource. It doesn't matter about the teachers. So we lose those teachers and then new teachers come in and those new teachers don't want to use the curriculum that was used before. They want to use something easy, they're going the other one. This and specifically includes Lowell School, one of, the, one of the most important schools the Clean Network has that has been using climate generation curriculum for many years, right? Teaching it more, teaching it, and they're not going to use it anymore because the new teacher doesn't want to use it. So climate generation is losing one of the most important schools it has that uses climate generation material. Lowell School hosted a climate generation summer institute in 2019. So it's the thing of I'm, I'm eager to work with whomever curriculum we're doing this and say, can we learn from this? What can we say? How do we do this? I mean, it matters if some important schools and teachers stop using our material we got to learn how to get new ones to do that. So anyway, it's just, if that's of any interest to people, uh, I, I enc encounter people all the time. It's about what they are saying about clean. There's the thing of, you know, the feedback from the teachers, what they say off the record, right? I mean, when they're talking to me, they're not talking at a big convention. They're, they're saying what they got. So anyway, that's the one I want to share. There's a lot of conversations that are going on. Thank you. I hey, have Scott next. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Um, James, just along those, you know, you mentioned the, the burnout there. I actually have two two resources to share. The first one that I put in the chat um, is on climate activism without burnout. It's actually a, a webinar I heard last week by a fantastic professor out of uh, Yale University, uh, Lori Santos, and, and uh, she has adapted some of the work she does to talk about how you achieve happiness to specifically talk about how people in the climate field avoid burning out. And I'm sure some of the lessons are going to be relevant for educators too. I just posted that as a link that people might take a look at. Uh, the other thing that I'll put in totally unrelated, but uh, is a book that I am reading called On the Move. And it talks about climate migration within the United States and the issues that we're 
facing now and going are, are going to be facing in the future. And to me, it's always interesting in, you know, perspective that might be in different subjects, you know, whether those are social studies, some of the movement, demography, or some of these other areas that people can bring in to talk about the issue of climate change and how it's going to impact this country. I think that's that's an important one for, I think, people to, to read and especially people in cities and policy development and how you accommodate people in or away from where you are. So it's an interesting, I think it's an interesting resource anyway, I recommend that. Thanks, Scott. Colleen next. Bless you, Carolyn. <laughs> Thanks. I've added, I opened up that link. I'm probably going to be watching that webinar right after this meeting, <laughs> listening to that. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And I'm, uh, I shared it in the chat, but I really enjoyed the webinar from a week or two ago from um, NAAEE about emotional intelligence. And it, it um, as part of it, they had a Padlet that had some great resources that I've been going through. And it doesn't look like the link to the Padlet is on their web, their information page about the webinar. So I made sure to include it there, but definitely recommend that as well. And then I was trying to find the recent is um, recent posts from the Climate Optimist. I don't know if other people are subscribed to that Substack, but I find it really helpful you know, having some positive <laughs> messaging and. Um, she wrote one recently about thinking about our time differently, which I think also relates to, you know, this preventing burnout and, you know, all of that is all related. So put a link there to her latest post. That's great. Uh, insider resources there, Colleen. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, anybody else have any like things they want to share with the group? Your news, any new projects starting? Um, it's um, I'm not 100% sure when it will be um, when it will be published yet, but I just got um, myself and a and a professor at FSU um, just got a paper accepted on um, like place place-based learning um, around climate change in rural communities. And we really focused on um, like sort of the, the teacher's development as like an advocate, you know, sort of being comfortable in some of these, um, I don't wanna say like non-traditional, but a little bit of outside the box thinking when it came to the lesson, doing some community science. And again, like really um, working primarily with the teacher on how she could develop and implement these kinds of lessons. Um, and I was, I was thinking of kind of about it, and I know this is super education-y jargon, but taking that principle of co-constructing knowledge and instead of thinking about it as students, like having education, like researchers and curriculum developers and teachers that are co-constructing this curriculum that the teacher is going to use and how powerful that is for getting teachers to be more comfortable with the material and, you know, like comfortable advocating with and for their students. So um, I'm really excited and uh, we've got some talks to do uh, further work on, on this kind of project. Um, I don't want to give like the official title yet because it's still technically a preprint publication, but I will definitely um, send it out on the listserv when they finally decide to publish it. Awesome. Yeah, that's exciting. I'm excited to read that. Cool. We've got New York City Climate Week coming up, and I read the Florida Climate Week's coming up in October. Oh, did you hear though? Um, sorry, the New York Times has like a panel for New York Climate Week, and one of their panelists is like the head of the Heritage Foundation, one of the people who wrote Project 2025. Oh, gosh. I didn't read that. Yeah, it's interesting with all these Climate Week stuff leading up to the election. There you go. Why is New York Times inviting Project 2025's architect to a climate ideas event? Maybe that should be something we all read. <laughs> well, there, there, there it is. <laughs> Thank you. One of the things that I've noticed 
when finding the teachers do they come up to us and do things that are teaching climate change and want support and do things that I've recently think what am I going to put in the column if the guy who paints himself orange wins right I mean it's going to be a devastating a lot's going to cut back but who's going to continue is is it there are going to be a lot of organizations even federal agencies that are either can't or won't operate the way they've done before but how will climate education continue and do things one of the things I would see is it's a characteristic of so many of the teachers who teach climate change that they're doing it quietly and independently they're not they're not they're not easy to find they're not coming to our institutes they're not coming to our teacher development site we find them you know we, we just go out and it's hard to find them at these big events and so on um so but that but there's a there's a positive side of that especially if they're in areas that are just using political terms, but I'm not saying this is how we teach it, the deeply blue areas like the barrier of DC. They don't have it. I don't think they have anything to worry about it. I mean, there's a small person in a small school. If, if the Project 2025 does what it wants to do, it's going to have its hands full, trying to put Kamala Harris in jail, trying to redo the Senate, and try to, you know, all this stuff. They're not going to have time to go down and go after individual teachers in schools in these other areas. So it's just a kind of a one of one of the areas where we can continue to have strength and that also goes in florida with cassandra i'm kind of looking at what ace is doing currently um you know uh, to, to see how you know how can we continue uh anyway there's just I, I just want to recognize that there's so many teachers who are reading and doing things and they're doing it quietly and they have independence I would, I would like to point out that here in florida they absolutely are targeting individual teachers um, the individual teachers are being disciplined, fired, doxxed, put on blast on, um, you know, local, if not national newspapers about what they're teaching. That's not to say that they're not still doing it. And like I said, the teachers we worked with focused on very, like I said, we did a very local place-based education, um, looking at water quality, addressing more of the impacts of climate change and kind of avoiding some of the more... <sighs> I mean, I, just, I refuse to call political terminology, but avoiding some of the scary words. Again, that's not to say that they're not doing it, but I think recognizing the personal and professional risks these teachers are taking by continuing to sort of, you know, do that on the down low um, should not be dismissed because they abs some of them absolutely are risking their jobs every day to teach this content. So Carolyn, are, is there talk of those teachers moving to other states? Because and get oh, just yeah, one of, credentialed and work there where they're gonna not be attacked. They're mostly just quitting. Um, I have a, I have, a, I'm so sorry, Cassandra. I, I do not mean to be, um, but like I have a friend who teaches a course called Human Geography that's part of an IB program. So it's not in the Florida State standards. And one of the state leads for like teachers and organizing and curriculum, like one of the mentors throughout the state, has left over persecution from her school district. Um, because again, she was, she's been, she's been attacked by parents and by school board members and was not defended by her, um, was not defended by her district. So she's, this is a very like advanced niche class and she's mentored half a dozen teachers across the state to teach it. And she has left the profession because of all of the attacks she's been weathering. So it is happening. They're quitting in droves. We have 30,000 empty, um, teaching positions in Florida. Um, and a lot, I mean, not all of it is this obviously, but, um, yeah, no, I just, like I said, it's still happening. I just think that they deserve so, so much credit, um, for putting themselves on the line like that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, please go it's ahead. Okay. I mean, I was just going to share, I was going to echo some of the same things that you shared. I, I am a parent as well as an advocate here in Florida. I shared in the comments that like many of the, um, Many of the teachers that I encountered last year when I was doing the in-person presentations, had, like who were really effective educators, did quit. However, I want to leave some room for optimism, though I do want to echo Carolyn's concerns that we should really commend these teachers for doing the work that they're doing and figuring out how to circumvent this difficult situation, which is um, the vilification of our educators, not only in climate, but across the board, wherever we can, wherever wherever they can be vilified for, for providing real honest education, they have been, right? However, um, you've got Scott on the call, you've got Carolyn, you've got Colleen, all of us from, from regions that have, um, 
have felt that pushback, right? And and we still have educators who are doing the work and we're the, we're the ones who are supposed to be the creatives behind like, how can we make this tangible and acceptable and and effective for our educators to, to continue providing this in, increasingly prolific education. We're the ones who are supposed to architect that for them and encourage them to use it and show them that like, we've got their back. We will, I mean, I know right now with ACE, we've actually pulled, you mentioned ACE, we've pulled our resources from Florida in a way, but we're developing new resources that are more um, palatable, I guess is the word that I'm looking for, palatable to, um, you know, move us away from fossil fuels, because really that is the goal, right? To educate, educate young people on, um, on how it is effective for them to move away from fossil fuels. As you talked about, uh, jobs, you know, that's kind of the direction that we're going in so that we can really, really make this knowledge, um, acceptable. Though I do say, like, again, leave hope. My my sixth grader is doing a unit right now in an IB public school on human um, human contributions to, you know, the changing climate. So it's not all bad, but we have the blueprint, James. We will figure it out. Thanks, everyone. I saved the chat. I'll put a little thing together and just for funsies, send it out to the listserv. Ask them what they're reading this week. See if we get any good responses for things. Hopefully there'll be a, like a, a rallying around this idea of how to build uh, emotional resilience and maintain ourselves without burnout. Because we all need that reminder, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you, Lindsay. This was such a great conversation. Yeah. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. Thanks. Cool. Uh, Have a great rest of your day. Mm-hmm.